hand over to Marilise, who's our lead clinician. And Marilise will give some introductions. Um, and then I'll give some science. Uh, and then we'll give you some details about the clinical trial and um, sort of details of the hospitals. So um, Marilise, I will share the screen um, for the slides. Hand over to you to introduce what we're doing. Um, I'm not able to put it on a large, okay, perfect. Well, um, first of all, we want to thank Helen and Chris for setting this up and organizing this webinar. We are very happy to present uh, you with information about the STOP uh, FOP trial. As you can see on the first slide, it was initi an initi initiative of Alex Bullock and Paul Yu, who demonstrated preclinical the effect of saracatinib at FOP. This was in co collaboration with AstraZeneca. You see on the uh, slide, uh, right side, the downside, DONG, and together with the three clinical FOP sites, Amsterdam, you see my name, um, with London, Richard King, you will hear more from him today, and Garmisch Partenkirchen, uh, Clemens Stockklausner. Uh, we set up a partnership that has um, uh, to investigate this further, Saracatinib, and for this we have received an EU IMI grant application. Uh, you can also see um, uh, the name Bernard Smilde, um, who is um, organizing uh, um, this together with us, this trial. We plan to start the study this year, uh, but we found to need more time to additional paperwork and rules we had to comply related to Brexit and COVID-19, among others. Regarding COVID-19, we hope that all of you and your family have remained healthy and were not affected by COVID-19. In Europe, the various countries can slowly start the trials with Amsterdam now taking lead, but other sites will follow soon, uh, as you will hear from, hear from Richard King. Clemens Stocklausner, from Germany cannot be here today, but next weekend Germany will keep a well-known patient meeting digitally and of course he will be there as well as us. Hereby I show you the agenda. I think Alex you need to help me because I can't, yeah, perfect, uh, already um, um, Alex told you I'm giving the introduction and also uh, some information about uh, executive centers. Uh, Alex will tell the preclinical parts, uh, Bernard the overview, and of course, Richard about London. Next uh, slide. Yes, three clinical sites are situated in Europe. It's of course also a grant from the Euro European uh, IMI. Um, in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, Garmisch Partenkirchen, Germany, and London, United Kingdom. Um, I, I will tell you here something more about Amsterdam, and you will hear more about London. Amsterdam, where I'm working, and Bernard Smilden. Can you give the next slide, please? Uh, we are a university hospital uh, with dedicated FOP research team. Um, and clinical team of more than 15 um, disciplines, easy access, uh, accessible by car, by train and plane at the hotel next to the hospital. Next slide, please. Um, perfect. Here you see our team members dedicated to FOP. Next slide, please. And of course, Amsterdam, like London and Karmisch Partenkirchen, well-known cities, beautiful cities. Next slide, please. Uh, the COVID also has impact in, uh, for all sides. Uh, for Amsterdam, after a very short stop, we successfully, successfully could continue to provide care, not only care, but also go on with um, uh, trials because we have 
had access to multiple other treatment locations that were very safe and of course we strict uh, convert to hospital and uh, government measures next slide please yes our way of working in amsterdam well we are um we are a team that always want to col collaborate with uh, other team members of uh, with other universities pharmacies but most importantly with patients and safety is one of our main uh, issues safety of the patients we are an international referral center um, for diagnosis and follow-up we have a very large imaging center you can see below um, there we are very experienced in the uh, sodium fluoride PET CT uh, genetic centers and diff different uh, of several other centers. We also perform several trials in FOP, but StopFop is the only one who just is open for uh, inclusion, and you will uh, hear more from uh, Bernard in the next uh, part of the talk. But first of all, next slide. I want to give over to Alex. Alex, all to you. Thank you, Marilise. So for anyone who's just joined, um, we have the three clinical centers in London, in Amsterdam, and in Garmisch in Germany. So Marilise has just given a little introduction to Amsterdam and an overview of the team. Um, so I'm going to hand over, I'm going to carry on with some of the data that led up to the trial. So how did we um, identify saracatinib as a potential treatment for FOP? And how does it work? And I'm based in the University of Oxford, um, sometimes sunny. Um, so it's an, also a nice place to visit. Let's see if I get the slides. Okay. So um, I just want to give you a kind of conceptual picture of how we aim to stop FOP, as in the stop FOP trial. Um, so the FOP protein itself is embedded in a fatty lipid membrane that sits around all of your cells in your body. So muscle cells and bone cells, nerve cells, etc. They're all encapsulated compartments that have a membrane. And, and the FOP protein, known as ACVR1 or ALK2, sits in this membrane, and so it has half of itself on the outside and half of itself on the inside. And it combined these things called BMPs, or bone morphogenetic proteins, and the FOP variant can also bind activin. And this is like shown in the cartoon. And the binding of these types of hormones or growth factors trigger a response on the other side of the membrane. And we know that these bone morphogenetic proteins and the FOP case activin trigger this formation of signals that then lead to make bone. And early on, after the discovery of the FOP gene, various groups um, were studying the mechanism, what was going wrong with FOP. And it was very clear quite early that with some of the variants found in FOP patients, so you might know that every, every person has lots and probably thousands of gene variants so we all have different hair colors, shapes and sizes and weights, et cetera. And they all are due to genetic variants. And so the FOP variant in this case has an unfortunate effect where this signaling by the FOP protein ACVR1 is exaggerated. And we have a signal that says make more bone when it should have stopped. And so what we want to do is have a drug that will block the where FOP proteins send this signal to make new bone. And we can do that with drug molecules that effectively bind the mouthpiece or the active site of the protein. And these drugs um, are known in the scientific field, at least as kinase inhibitors, because the FOP protein itself is a protein kinase. And all that means is it's a protein that goes around and stamps phosphate groups onto other proteins. And I have a little movie that just shows what we've been doing in terms of our research, looking at how drugs bind the protein. So we can use x-rays and we can find the positions of all the atoms in this intracellular part of the FOP protein. We can simplify that here as a skin. And we can see this mouth 
of the protein. And this is the bit that acts to find and send signals. And then we can visualize how drug molecules can then bind to this mouth of the protein. And these are some of the really early stage uh, compounds that we identified either in Paul Yu lab, Paul Yu lab in uh, Harvard or in my lab in Oxford. And the reason we can see is all the atoms are too small to see under any normal microscope. But if we use x-rays, the x-rays have a wavelength that's quite similar to the sizes of atoms. And so using x-rays, we can actually see or derive um, the atomic structure of the protein and how all the atoms fit. And so drug design can be, drug discovery can be very much viewed as um, looking for the sort of lock and key. What is the lock that we can use to turn off the FOP uh, process to make bone? Okay, so it's slightly more, so with any lock and key, the trick is to find the right key. And so drug discovery in many ways is somewhat like finding the shoe that fits Cinderella. And so much of the work is saying, let's screen different drugs, let's screen different molecules, trying to find the right shoe for the FOP protein. And so this work was done um, in various groups across the world using different strategies. In our lab, this was done by Eleanor Williams, who's been funded thanks to the support of FOP Friends in the UK, um, also FOP Friends, and also from my FOPA. And um, we've had various support and other times from FOP Switzerland and others. We're very grateful for all that support. So this now enabled Ellie to screen lots of drugs that we had in the lab. And first off, we just test how well do they bind the protein, uh, how, how well they bind the FOP protein. And one can call this potency. And I've put an asterisk here in the middle, and that is the hit that we had the saracatinib. And what we found is that by far this was the most uh, active inhibitor against the FOP protein. And I've shown on the top right, this is just the chemical structure of saracatinib. So these are all the individual atoms. So N would be a nitrogen atom, O would be an oxygen atom, H would be a hydrogen atom, and all the lines would be carbons. And this is a molecule developed by AstraZeneca in Manchester in the UK. Now, I tell you why this is important. So in the movie, I showed you some of our early compounds. But it's extremely challenging to make a drug because it has to be all of these things in yellow boxes. So it has to be stable to metabolism, it has to be safe may want it not to reach the brain. You may want it to be um, stable to storage, etc. stable in the stomach. It has to taste okay, it has to be soluble, etc. All of these things take enormous effort again. And so that's where all the expertise of a major pharmaceutical company like AstraZeneca comes into play. So the next challenge was then to see that's the theory, would it work in practice? And there we collaborated with the team at Paul Yu in Harvard University. And they were helped by having access to the Regeneron mouse model of FOP. <clears throat> and so um, we're very grateful also to Aris Economides and his team at Regeneron for helping academics as well as their own uh, efforts. So here I show two mice as an example. So they're both um, carrying the FOP variant and one of them we leave to develop heterotopic bone. So in the hind limb here on the red circle you see the growth of extra bone on the leg and that is an untreated mouse. Now if we do the same experiment but this time we treat with saracatinib then we follow the mice for over a month. See that one of them. I'm just going to try and mute somebody. There we go. Okay. So um, then we can see in the green circle that we've prevented that bone formation. 
And of course, this is really nice and encouraging news in the mouse. And that gives us encouragement uh, to continue. Um, Paul's also done some more experiments, and I'll show these on the right. So obviously FOP prevention is the big aim. Um, another potential future application could be to help more existing patients, um, those who've already developed uh, lock joints, for example. And so on the top, um, you can see with the arrow in white, the showing bone formation in a mouse hind limb on the, on the leg. And what Paul did and his colleague Dong Dong, they surgically removed that bone. But then after six weeks after the surgery, if you do another um, CT scan, the bone has come back again and it's in exactly the same place as it was. And in fact, um, if you follow it further, the bone will actually grow to be bigger than it was before the surgery. So as many of you may know, surgery can be very, very harmful for FOP patients. However, if we do the same process, treating now with saracatinib, so again, white arrow on the bottom, uh, mouse panel, CT scan, shows pre-existing bone formation on the hind limb. And then Paul's team surgically removed that bone but this time, when they did the surgery and then after the surgery, they treated the mouse with saracatinib. And in this particular mice, um, mouse, the saracatinib actually prevented this reoccurrence of the bone formation in the lock joint. So this again was highly encouraging that saracatinib could stop this process of bone formation in FOP. Now I should say this is a very complicated procedure to do because all your joints have uh, many nerves and muscles, et cetera, that we want to protect. And so there's still um, some research here to do. And what we would like to do is show in uh, the protective model in patients that saracatinib is effective before trying this type of surgery as a clinical trial. The other thing we learned from Paul's work is that when we look at the, if we take the major hind limb bones, for example, if we look at their length or we look at their bone mineral density, then saracatinib did not disrupt the normal growth or the normal appearance of normal bone. So it was really just stopping this abnormal bone, the unwanted bone. As I said, AstraZeneca had developed saracatinib. And one of the reasons we were interested in this um, drug was because it's been used in patients before, similar to how paliveratin had been used before in the drug that Clementia were working on. Um, it's not an approved drug like saracatinib. You cannot just go to the pharmacist and buy a, pill, a set of pills of, of saracatinib. It's still a drug that needs to be um, used in clinical trials and tested. Um, so it's been used in over about 700 patients. Many of these would have been healthy volunteers. Many others were done in cancer. Um, more recently, it's been tried in Alzheimer's disease and a lung fibrotic disease called LAM. And in healthy volunteers, um, a single dose was given up to a gram and that could be tolerated. And then in cancer, where it's been used, say, for one or two months, um, with over 600 patients, it was used in phase two and phase three trials. And there they used it with 175 milligrams per day. Um, and then for longer treatments, such as nine to 12 months, so a year trial, as for example, done in the Alzheimer trial, they used a slightly lower day, dose to keep the safety and that was between 100 and 125 milligram dose. Now from our mouse work, we've seen that the saracatinib can be effective at the lowest doses. So in this clinical trial, a dose of 0.1 gram or 100 milligrams as a daily dose would be equivalent to what we see as being effective in the mouse. And this is sort of roughly half the dose that was given to cancer patients. And that just helps to reduce some of the side effects you might have if you were a cancer patient, 
such as nausea and headaches, etc. Um, at this dose, um, the main um, side effects can be an upset stomach, so sort of gastrointestinal, uh, just sort of upset. So just as a summary slide, I thought I would share with you the differences between our trial and some of the other trials that are running. So as I said, the FOP protein is this receptor that sits in the membrane that surrounds a cell. This is just a textbook image of what the FOP protein does. So it binds these hormones or ligands as we call them in yellow at the top. And these you can think of as the BMP. And then that triggers different chemical messenger messengers that then trigger this response so acting on our DNA to turn genes on and off. And that's what causes us to join and form bone. So at the top, we have the BMP. And then we have that binds the receptor, the FOP protein. And then these chemical messengers are the phosphate that gets added as it transmits signals down towards our DNA. And then new genes are turned on and off. And that may juice, induce stem cells, for example, to grow into bone. Now, the Regeneron clinical trial has an antibody, and that binds to the active in one of these ligands or growth factors on the outside of the cell. And that actually blocks it from binding to the receptor. So it blocks it from binding to the FFP protein. Um, Clementia are targeting somewhat downstream in the action of turning genes on and off. And then the saracatinib, that acts directly on the FOP protein itself. So the mouth of the protein that's hyperactivated. So we're telling it to stop. So what's interesting about the clinical trials is that we're not all duplicating exactly what each other is doing, which would be a waste of money and a waste of effort and a waste of patient's time. All of the clinical trials are trying different ideas to stop FOP. Um, so that has maximizing the chances that one of these could be the best strategy. But if multiple clinical trials are successful, it also means there could be multiple types of treatments available and different treatments may be more suitable for different patient, different patient cohorts. A big challenge after the science was then getting the money to actually run the trial. Um, and as Marilee said, we, were, we went to Brussels and we pitched to the European Union um, to get money to run a trial across Europe. Um, so there are probably too few patients in the UK to really set up a really effective trial just with the UK and similarly in Germany or other European countries. Um, and we were successful. So the EU have given us a 1 million euro grant uh, to help fund run the trial. And then AstraZeneca contribute in kind um, with a 1 million euro contribution, which is in fact providing the drug molecules. And the photo on the right just shows us outside the offices of the EU in uh, Brussels before we went into the interview. And then this is us after the interview where we had happy faces. Um, although we didn't know whether we were successful, but we had a feeling we were successful. Um, and this is where we could seriously start planning. Let's um, organize how we would um, start recruiting patients, etc. So this was before COVID-19 struck. So that's all from me from the science. We can have some questions at the end, but I'll, I'll hand over to Bernard, who's project managing this whole process and he can tell you a little bit more about the clinical trial. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And uh, uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for attending and giving us this chance uh, to tell you something about the Stop Hop trial. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bernard Smilde. Uh, I think I've seen some of you on, on congresses or during other uh, visits to our hospital. Um, uh, I'm, uh, like Alex said, I'll be uh, managing the project internationally uh, from Amsterdam on behalf of Marilies. Uh, and today I'm going to tell you uh, some general overview of what the trial will look like. Of course, I can never cover uh, every subject that we would like to. We have a whole information package uh, uh, for people who are actually interested in participating. Um, 
uh, but I'll give you a general overview so you will know what the trial will look like. Uh, if you could move to the next slide. Um, so STOPFOP stands for the surrogatinib trial to prevent FOP. Um, like Alex already explained, uh, we're not sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we're sponsored by the European Union and we're doing it together with all the partners that you see on the, on the right side of the slide. Um, and those are all academic centers uh, together with AstraZeneca, who, as Alex said, will provide uh, uh, surrogatinib to us. Um, and from the start, we've been working together with the stakeholders board, um, which means representatives from IFOPA and from several national patients organizations, including the Netherlands, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy and Sweden. Um, and we've been getting a lot of input and uh, feedback from them uh, about how to run the trial and how to uh, uh, approach uh, uh, everybody with FOP, how to make them aware of this trial. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what StopFOP is, I got this from the IFOPA website, uh, is a phase two clinical trial. If you could press next slide, I think that shows a red circle around it. Yeah. Um, so this is the first trial that we're doing uh, in FOP patients. Like Alex described, we've already seen uh, uh, how seracatinib works in a lot of patients and healthy volunteers uh, who don't have uh, FOP. Um, so this is the first trial in FOP patients to see if all the uh, preclinical work that looks really promising uh, uh, is also effective in FOP patients. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what we aim to do is to see how effective seracatinib can be in preventing uh, bone formation in FOP. Um, and there are several ways that we will look into this. So we will use the PET-CT, which is, um, I, think, I think a lot of patients have undergone CT, which is a big scanner, um, to see where there's bone in the body. Um, and the, the PET, uh, which stands for positron emission tomography, um, uh, means that before we go into the CT, we inject a, a special kind of material which attaches to uh, a bone that is not ready formed, the bone that is forming at the moment. So on the PET-CT, we can see the bone that has already been formed in the past and bone that is forming uh, at this moment. Uh, so it gives us an idea of how active uh, your FOP is. Um, and on the other hand, we'll be using uh, a daily diary uh, to see whether there are any flare-ups uh, and several questionnaires to see uh, what the general status of your FOP is um, to give us more of a clinical view. Um, and of course, uh, we'll also be looking at the safety of seracatinib uh, in people with FOP. Um, we've already, uh, uh, this is already, is a drug that has already been tested in quite a lot of people. Um, so we know in general what, uh, what the safety profile is and what we can expect. Um, but of course, we want to monitor uh, uh, in FOP patients what the side effects will be. And we'll be looking into uh, blood results, into urine results. We'll be taking uh, uh, electrocardiograms um, to see if everything's going all right. And of course, the main goal behind all of this is that we hope to discover an effective medicine to stop FOP. Um, which we will have to see during this trial. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have three clinical trials, uh, uh, clinical sites, excuse me. Um, so we've got a site in Amsterdam, in Garmisch, and in London. Um, and it is possible to participate uh, uh, outside of these countries. Um, and just because we are a European, we, we've got three European sites, we're funded by the EU, we're a European study. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best for us to get patients from the European Union. Um, and uh, other applications, uh, we have to uh, judge on a case-by-case -case basis whether it's possible, whether it's uh, the, the, all the travel uh, to our sites is possible, and uh, uh, whether it's, uh, it, it, it's safe. Uh, and we have a uh, backup system in the country of your residence. Next slide, please. Um, so this is what the 
stop up trial will generally look like. Uh, the first six months of the trial is what is known as a randomized controlled trial. Some of you might have heard about this before, but I'll just explain just to be sure. A randomized controlled trial is, um, well, it's, it's sort of the holy grail of, of clinical research. And it's the only real way to make sure that we uh, uh, know that, that the drug is doing what we hope that it's doing. Um, so what will happen is that once someone enters the trial is that there's sort of like a lottery um, which determines in which group you, you're, you're designated to. So there's a 50% chance that you are treated with seracotinib during this, these first six months and there's a 50% chance that you'll be treated with placebo which is a fake drug which looks ex actually exactly the same uh, as seracotinib. Um, but which does not contain the active ingredient. Um, and the reason we do this is because that's the only way that we can compare the, bo the two groups and see what the difference between those two groups is and make sure that this is a treatment that actually works for FOP. Um, and then afterwards, there's another 12 month period of the trial in which everybody gets uh, the drug. So we compare the group that previously didn't get the drug to uh, to the group uh, that is that uh, to to itself to to its previous results, and we compare the entire group to uh, data that we have from earlier trials. So this increases the uh, the amount of evidence that we have that this drug might be functional. So in the end uh, of this 18 month trial, everybody will be treated with sarcatinib. Um, and afterwards, uh, seracotinib can be continued by, uh, by patients who participate in the trial um, uh, until we can determine whether it is indeed in effective uh, and, and if it can be admitted as a drug for FOP. Um, next slide, please. For patients, it comes down to 10 visits within these 18 months. Um, so this is a, a bit less intense than some of the trials that we've got, uh, which comes down to just around one visit in every three months. What it starts with is an eligibility visit. So first of all, um, uh, if you're interested, uh, after this I'll give you some, some contact information. Um, and uh, uh, then your physician uh, will together with you see uh, whether you meet all of the criteria that are, that are needed uh, to participate in this trial. Um, then afterwards, uh, if, if that all checks out through the phone or through email, um, then you visit one of the clinical sites. And we see, uh, uh, together with blood work, uh, uh, look at the urine, uh, we do some additional tests to see if you're really eligible to participate in the trial. If that all works out, then we start with seracotinib. Uh, which I should mention is, is administered orally, so it, uh, you don't need to get an, uh, an IV uh, to get uh, seracotinib. You take uh, two pills each day. Um, and this medication can be crushed. So it can be crushed uh, in case you have a jaw uh, that is locked up. Uh, it can still, still be taken uh, uh, together uh, with, with, with some water or uh, with, uh, with some custard, for example. Um, and then during the trial, once, uh, once uh, somebody is included, we ask them to keep a diary which contains around three questions that you get every day about uh, is your FOP active, uh, uh, are you in pain because of your FOP for example. Um, during the visits we take blood and we take urine, uh, we do pulmonary tests at four time points, we do some cardiac tests. Uh, we ask you to answer questionnaires and at uh, four time points, we do a PET CT during this time. Next slide, please. So who are we looking for? We are looking to include in this trial around 20 FOP patients between 18 and 65 years old. Um, and we are asking that they have the classic uh, R206H mutation. Um, because we need to have a, a group that looks like each other as much as possible. Um, so that's, there was a lot of discussion about it, but that's why it was uh, decided that we could only include patients with a classic mutation in this trial, unfortunately. Um, of course, you have to be 
willing to participate in the trial uh, and able to. And one of the things that we'll be looking for is uh, whether you're able to undergo a PET-CT scan, uh, because this is our main outcome measure for our trial. So we'll be looking uh, if you can actually fit into the CT scanner, uh, because we know that some patients are unable to because their joints are locked up. Um, and we're looking for patients with little other health issues, um, which of course will have to be judged on a case by case basis uh, by the trial physician at your hospital. Um, and, and, and you can discuss with them uh, uh, whether one of those health issues is a limit, uh, is limiting participation or not. Uh, next slide, please. So if you're interested after all of this, um, you can visit stopfab.com, which contains some of the information that we've told here today as well. And there's a, if you scroll down on that website, there's a, a, a contact form at the bottom that you can use uh, to contact me. You can also contact me directly through my email address. Uh, uh, and for UK related questions, I recommend contacting Richard Keane. Um, next slide, please. So these are the people from Amsterdam that we'll be working together with. Next slide, please. Um, and now I uh, would like to give the word to uh, Dr. Richard Keane to tell you a bit more about stuff up in the UK. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving up your Saturday morning to, to listen to us. So I hope you're finding it interesting. And I'm, I'm not going to talk for too long, so there'll be plenty of time for uh, questions at the end. Um, next slide, please, Alex, if you can just advance. So yeah, so this is just my title. So yeah, I mean, hopefully as, as people, know, as you've heard, obviously we're the UK site for this study. Um, I'm the lead clinician for the metabolic bone services at the RNOH, and we've had an active interest in clinical and uh, research related to FOP for uh, several years, as many of you will know, looking at the participation of the participants that we've got um, logged in for the, for the meeting now. Can I have the next slide, please. So I think, again, the RNOH is a, for those of you that don't know, we're, 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 I think we're an ideal location for conducting studies uh, in, in the UK. If we can start to build the slide, please. Um, so again, we've got, for those people that might be traveling sort of, you know, around the, uh, to us, we've got good access to motorway networks. We're located in North London. Um, that for those people that might need to fly either within the UK or if there were other European um, patients who were interested in attending we've got good access to local airports assuming that there are some flights in the post-covid era um, we've also got local hotels which again people have used um, and that, um, sort of for attending other studies and so although you know that's quite useful because it means that the hotel staff you know have have, have been used to dealing with families um, with people with FOP and the needs that they would have um, and again our clinical team have had experience in dealing with that um, and again this is perhaps just more pertinent to people in the UK um, there's free car parking uh, which again although that might not seem a lot is, is quite important I think for a lot of people if you are attending and again although the number of visits uh, as Bernard said is only sort of once per every three months on average um, you know we want to minimize uh, cost uh, to, to individuals so the next slide please Again, we've for those of you that have been to sort of us in our study site, what, what you can find is that we're ideally placed as well. Obviously, Marilis um, sort of gave a very good description of what's available in Amsterdam, and there's lots of good things you can do in Amsterdam. But in us, one thing, obviously, if you want to visit Wembley Stadium, but I think the next one on the build here is the one that most people who come to our site find. You've got Harry Potter World um, pretty close, and a lot of the patients that have come to our clinical trials have really then enjoyed a fun day out. And again, I'm pretty sure that, that, that there will be social distancing, but Harry Potter world is open and ready for business. Um, so that's my plug for, uh, for that. The, I think the other thing as well, this is just a picture an, an, a, of our um, hospital site. And I've said it's green hospital, and you can see that although you might imagine that we are in London, we are right on the outskirts. And again, we're, we're, we've got a very good um, geographical position. But I think what's important in the current climate is you know and again Marilise talked about this in her presentation of Amst the Amsterdam facilities is that you know, we are entering a different world um, with how we run our clinical services and our clinical trials um, 
And our hospital is very much focused on being what we call a green site. And this isn't just that we're eco-friendly, it's very much that we're trying to minimize the risk of having COVID disease within the hospital. Uh, we don't have an emergency department. So there's an awful lot of processes in place that means that you know opening up to clinical trials is possible. Um, and you know, we are, you know, we've been able to sort of maintain clinical activity despite the pandemic and the surge that happened. And we've got plans in place to, to keep um, our patients and our staff safe. And on the right, you can just see sort of our lead adult clinical team who were redeployed to the wards during the surge. And so you can see me sort of sneaked at the back there in my surgical scrubs. So, you know, th th there's an awful lot of effort to make sure that when you do come to our site, um, that, you know, you're going to be safe um, and that, you know, the, the studies will proceed. I think one thing that, again, has happened due to the COVID pandemic, which again has put a bit of a stall in the UK sort of just getting ready to, to, to activate the trial was that obviously we were at the point of almost going through into the a UK ethics submissions and very much with the COVID pandemic, one, a lot of things shut down, but then of course, a lot of the research activity um, that the, the regulatory authorities were looking at was COVID related. So, you know, we've been, the UK has been doing a lot of research into COVID disease. And so again, I think now that all that's sort of dying down a bit and the studies are being done, hopefully the regulatory approval for the study will move forward uh, quite quickly. Can I have the next slide, please. Again, I think for those of you that um, have come to our site already, either for research trials or for standard NHS care, um, you know, we have got an experienced team uh, who are involved in looking after adult and children uh, with FOP. Obviously, for this study, it's, it's, it's an adult uh, study with people over the age of 18. But also our research team are very experienced at looking after patients, helping coordinate, you know, travel, hotel arrangements, um, and just ha making sure that patients can move through the hospital system um, and that also the other hospital staff have also, are also aware of the needs of an FOP, um, a person with FOP, um, you know, what they can and can't do and how we can again facilitate uh, things to be as stress-free as, as possible. Can we on this next slide please? Unlike Amsterdam, we don't have a PET scanner on site at our hospital. Um, and again, so we've worked quite closely with the Regeneron study uh, with the team at St. Thomas's Hospital, which is in central London. And again, that does involve transport from one hospital to another, which again, we would in the COVID environment make sure is safe and you know secure. Um, but again, the attraction, if you wanted to, of course, is St. Thomas's Hospital is right in the centre of London. And basically all these sort of lovely um, sort of things from the cartoon of the skyline would be on your doorstep um, if you wanted to just take a few minutes out after you've had your PET scan. So again, it's, for some patients, it can be an attraction to sort of be, be, be in the centre of London Again, that may be something a bit different in the, in, in the current climate. But again, the important thing is that the, the team at St. Thomas's have been let's say, working on the Regeneron study. So they've been used to dealing with patients, um, making sure that the, the PET scan is, you know, is, a, is a good experience and that, you know, that, that they can facilitate people. And again, as Bernard said, we, we do need to make sure that people can, um, if they're able to have these sorts of scans but in our experience you know, we've, we've not had you know major problems with with people having the uh, the pet ct scan um it's 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 not as it's not a claustrophobic scan it's not mri uh, and most of our patients have actually found that you know if we can assess them and if if you take your time then everything will will work well if i have the next slide please so i think again i think because of our you know, our experience of looking after people with FOP, both um, through national health service care and through the clinical trials, we, we, we want to make sure that, you know, participating in the trial is as stress-free as possible. Um, you know, your families and patients will be giving up their time to come into the study. Obviously, with any study, we don't know it's going to work. So we want to make sure that we, everything is as stress-free we will try and work around you know other appointments that you may have because again to minimize transport to and from hospital sites unnecessarily we've moved very much to you know as we are with today we're doing a zoom meeting so lots of you know face-to-face -face and virtual clinics can be done so i think you know we will be looking at other ways to facilitate contact with the research team um, so that you know 
I think that will be better. Um, so it might, won't always just be at the end of the telephone. I think again, you know, we have got an established team. You know, we've been working with FOP patients for several years, and I think that's important as well with the clinical trial. Although it's only 18 months, you don't you want to sort of you want to be the team you start with in the trial should hopefully be the team you end with, uh, and I think that's really important. And we 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 we've got I think a very well established team that will help you uh, through the clinical trial process. And again, I think also you know this is you know this is. A, this is not a pharmaceutical trial so you know and although we've been very fortunate in getting eu funding we do know that you know it, it may not be you know that the funding that's there is is not the same as you may get from a regeneron or from an ipsen trial so we, we need to help patients and families you know with uh, maybe you know other things uh, expenses and incidentals so we will be trying to help patients we you know with um, sourcing other funds from other sources to, to, to facilitate their participation in the clinical trial and so hopefully again I think for people that haven't been to us you know you'll find that you know if you do enter the clinical trial and come to the UK it, and come to the London site it will be a very positive experience um, and we will do our best to, to, to look after you uh, and and make sure that you, that you do what, that everyone feels that they've benefited from participation uh, so thank you very much indeed So we're going to stop sharing the screen and open up to questions. Um, all of your microphones are likely muted at this point. So before you ask any questions, you'll have to just click on your uh, bottom of your screen to unmute. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you, Bernard. Um, don't be shy. Please, please uh, let us know any questions. Hello, I have a question. Uh, are you thinking about the kits? Uh, are you going to start working on the kits? Who wants to answer that? Richard, Marilise? Children in FOP. Um, well, the ch children in FOP is at the moment not... Um, we'll be starting with, with adults, so that may be later on, but at the moment the only adults that can um, participate. Yeah. The Saracata has, has never been used in children before, and so we would not be allowed to use it first in FOP uh, children. Um, so we would have to go uh, much further earlier in the clinical trials, probably phase one. Um, so it's, it's, it's really just the history of its development, that it was developed initially for ovarian cancer and obviously that's part of adult treatment so what we'd need to do is show it's effective in adults first and then we can go back and treat children and um, if you look at the other trials of Regeneron and Clementia that's also what they've done you know they've done initial trial with adults they've shown it's safe they've shown whether it's effective or not and then look at um, children so obviously we would like to do children in future but for the first trials, we have to stick with adults. Thank you. Could I ask a question, please? Go ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for your time, wherever you are in the world. Be a great presentation, very informative. Thank you all very, very much. Um, I'd like to ask a question around Britain exiting the EU. Uh -huh. um, and I know exactly, I know. <laughs> I'm glad you're smiling. <laughs> um, and the funding. Any results from that funding or projects associated with that funding? How would that affect any benefits going forward for patients in the UK? When we were doing our application for funding and having our interviews, we were extremely worried that Brexit would happen before we got the money. But now we've got the money, we're safe. Um, so we, we don't see any problems. No, Richard, do you have any comments? Richard, you. Yeah, that's right. I, I think the fact that we've established, you know, that the study has actually started and you know it, it's ongoing. My understanding is is that then the the, the funding will remain for the duration of the study. Uh, thank you. Could I just one more uh, quick point, please? Um, our daughter has just turned seventeen. Would that automatically rule her out of of the of the she, volunteering for the project? She'll turn eighteen next July. 
is does she need to be 18 as of now to be considered well it it it, it is um um the project is from 18 years on so we can't um Okay. We are not allowed to start in younger patients. Sure. Okay. But so, uh, so she, is the date that she, she would basically, as of today, would need to be 18. Is, yeah, is you need to. Yes, you need to be. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. okay. We, we don't right. know how long the inclusion will be, but as soon as 20 patients are in the study, the inclusion will stop. Okay. okay. Right. We don't know. I, I think July next year would be very long i oh, think okay okay understand that. Is thank, that you. Like, thank you the hospital regulators i'm sorry who, who fixes the age is that the hospital regulator i think if you if i mean you, know, you could have an example where if recruitment was slow mm -hmm. and you couldn't get and there were insufficient sub people who wanted to be part of the study then you know it someone would have to make a decision as to whether you, you, you could, it, theoretically, you could drop the age maybe to 16 or something, I would just say, but then you would go back to the argument about well, what, what safety data have you got in that age group. But okay. that, would, that would have to go back to the ethics committee to be considered, and there'd have to be data showing that you, know, you thought it was going to be safe in, if you dropped the, the, the entry criteria by a couple of years. Okay. That's that. Thank you. Thank you. But then you can also say we, we only have, it, it sounds a lot, but one million, and that is not enough to, well, you have to do it, you can't go on and take more time. We have to do it in a certain time. Also, we would like to, to perform and include more patients. We are, well, the money is, is limiting us, okay. of course. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is Chris. I have a very strange echo. Can you hear me? Yes. Just hear you, Chris. There was two questions came through on the chat. Um, yeah, I can see those. Um, related to participation of patients outside of the EU, for example, Russia. Um, and the other one was, what is the difference between a pharmaceutical company trial and an EU-funded trial like yours? Uh, maybe the the, the um, um, Russia patient uh, uh, Bernard. Maybe you want to comment. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, like I said earlier, we um, we do have three European trials, so that would be quite far away. Um, so, so th th these kind of questions have to be assessed on a case by case basis, um, and and uh, of course for. Um, uh, for patients out of the European Union, we have also less of a network of uh, hospitals, uh, of, of physicians that we know within those countries uh, that can guarantee care when we're very far away. Because, of course, this is an experimental medication. So if anything goes wrong, we want to make sure that uh, the, the, the care that you need is can be applied where you are and that you don't have to come to Amsterdam or London to get the care that you need, but that you also have a local hospital that can supply in that need. Um, so the, 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 this would have to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. So, so you can contact us through the contact form and we can look at what's possible. Um, um, but, but we're not sure at this point. And, and the second, se thank you. And, and the second uh, remark I want to make is that uh, about um, the money to travel. Um, we can provide uh, a small amount, but if if you come from further away we we have to discuss how to deal with this but probably you understand this answer but, i mean that relates to joseph's question about the difference between a pharmaceutical company and funding yeah. from the european union because in effect we've got governments the governments across europe are paying for the trial and it's not the governments of the uk and germany and and uh holland it's the governments across all the EU member states put in a pot of money. And so it's the governments that are funding all the elements of the trial from uh, travel and hospitals and treatments, et cetera. While with a pharmaceutical company, 
um, it's them who pay the costs of all of those things. Um, so um, governments are not quite as generous. But that, that's, so that's the only real difference. In terms of the medication, it's still a pharmaceutical company. Um, and um, in, in terms of other side effects, I mean, all the potential side effects um, will be something that will be given, be gone through with you in great detail um, when you're discussing enrollment. So Richard Merrilis and Clements in Germany would go through all of those. Um, I know in, in, in cancer patients where they have higher doses, um, the treatment can, in sort of for a short period, just uh, change things like uh, blood levels. But uh, at this lower dose, that, that side effect is uh, quite minimized. Um, yeah, so as I said, the main, the main side effect has been a kind of upset stomach. There was just a question. Um, someone asked whether, if the trial is going well, um, the EU can put more money in it. But um, maybe you will respond. Want to respond, Alex? Oh, no, but but um, yeah. unfortunately, the EU give you the money and then they say go away. <laughs> um, so that, um, even even if we say, oh, we would like to carry on for another twelve months, um, they they unfortunately say okay you well they could say no you can't do that in which case you have to stop or they could say yes you can do that but we're not going to give you any more money um that's i think in those types of cases um we would have to look for other sources of funding um and and yeah so that that's unfortunately governments are you know when they give a, a money they, they they have a fixed time well, now, now there's coming a question, so the trial would be incomplete then. Maybe Alex, <laughs> I'm in between. <laughs> I don't know, so, I don't, it's not, but maybe you can answer. Uh, no, I mean, we've, we've got three years. The, the trial is funded for three years. And so the, the aim is to complete this uh, six month and then 12 month treatment within the three years. Yes, and it has been counted that the number and the way we have made the design is enough to have a good uh, answer, to get a good answer. We didn't plan for COVID-19, but um, no. that's, I think the, the governments in the EU would hopefully understand that, that, that one. Yeah. And Chris, I don't know if you want to uh, come in, but I saw another question about the Brexit and maybe difficulties. Maybe, Chris, you agree it's a good question for Richard? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think we'd, we've we addressed that. As far as, as, far as we're aware, yes. I, I, I don't think the Brexit at the moment, and again, you know, we're not officially leaving till the till January, but I mean, I, I, my understanding is, is that because the grant's been awarded, that we will carry on. Um, I think, you know, so I don't, I don't think Brexit should affect recruitment to the study at the UK site. Yeah. Oh, what other questions? There was something about the six month analysis, whether we would be anal analyzing the results of the six, after, the, after the first six months. Um, maybe, um, Bernard, or maybe I can, well, at the moment, um, it, it's statistically the best to go on, but it will be, um, the data will be, um, analyzed by the statistician um, um, and depending on the results uh, um, it will be published uh, and otherwise we will go on and publish it at the end of the trial. Of course there are uh, certain uh, marks um, when we see that the trial is going on very well it will be published and when it doesn't work, of course, we will publish it as well. Yeah, so there's probably three outcomes after six months. Statistician, yeah. The statistician is completely independent of us and um, so that we can't bias the results. But the statisticians could tell you, this is going so successfully, we need to fast track. They could tell you it's not working and you'd stop, or they could tell you, um, it's promising enough to keep going, but we won't fast track. Um, okay. 
there's also I see that Chris has just posted about AZ's in AstraZeneca's involvement and whether you know what they would do if the study looks good. I mean, basically, is it does it, it would they pick it up for developing further or what's their maybe, input going to be? Maybe a good question also for Alex. Um, yeah, so um, we've had this discussion. Um, the likelihood is that they would um, like to. Um, somebody who's very keen on FOP would probably take it up. Um, so as you know, we've had uh, a number of groups that have led FOP clinical trials, like startups like Clementia and things. And so it would probably go into a focused effort really around FOP rather than being led by uh, the sort of the size of AstraZeneca. It would, it would go into something more specialized to be towards FOP. There's, a, there's another question for uh, Bernard. Bernard, do you read it from Luke? Yeah, I see uh, from um, about the PET-CT scan that it requires an injection and how it is in safety uh, concerning FOP. Um, so we, it does require an injection. It uh, requires uh, an IV to be put in. Um, and uh, this is something that we have a lot of experience in with FOP patients at the different centers. Uh, for example, in Amsterdam, we have a, a team of three trained anesthesiologists uh, who are uh, uh, who are very experienced in doing vena puncture, uh, drawing blood uh, for, from uh, FOP patients. Um, and during the procedure of drawing blood, which needs to be done around uh, every three months, as you indicated, uh, it is uh, it's done with an IV tube, and the same IV tube can also be used Bernard, for the patient. Do you just want to explain what an IV is? Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, so so an IV is uh, uh, when we put a, a, a very small plastic tube uh, within one of the veins of your body uh, to either draw blood or to inject something into the veins of the body. Uh, so this is a, a small injection uh, which is very similar to taking blood. I think also, Alex, do you just want to comment on how frequently the PET scan is? Because yes. the question seems to imply every three months the scans are not every three months are they no no we do draw the blood uh, uh, every three months uh, but the pet ct scan is every six months uh, yes. so at the beginning uh, we do a pet ct scan to see what the basic your base level of activity of the fop is and then every six months we evaluate how much the drug uh, is working um, and, and just to come back to the safety issue, uh, this is something we've done very frequently uh, with FOP patients in the past and which we have never seen a flare up uh, because we have it done by very experienced people. Yeah, I, I understand putting needles in the blood is no risk, but putting needles in the muscular injections, like some of the vaccines, um, that's the risk. So it should be fine. Yes. Uh, there's another question, um, whether the dose is adapted to a flare and not a flare. Um, well, that, that, that isn't. We have one, one dosage and that remains the same. Yes. So it's similar to the Regeneron study, which was based. So basically you've got a fixed dosing irrespective of the flare status. Obviously the palivaritine study from Ipsen, um, that, in, that involved flare up dosing schedules um, but th 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 as Marilee says this is just a fixed dose throughout the whole uh, 18 months of the study. That is an other question from Nikki maybe someone uh, Alex it's good for you the question from Nikki. I'm just trying to find it. She's basically saying is, is another company if, would a AZ release the IP to someone else? Oh yes absolutely yes so um, that you know, the the idea would be that you would probably form a, a new company um, to take forward saracatinib in phase three trials, or whatever the future path would be. Okay. Um, so that would still be a at the moment it's a joint venture because um, AstraZeneca have obviously got the historical development of the compound in terms of its patents, and then all the data from the clinical trial so the application patents so the patents of treating this in the clinic that would all be held by uh, your clinicians so the hospitals in Amsterdam Germany and London 
Um, so it's at this point, it's a partnership in terms of patents between the two partners. Um, and then, um, so both partners would then look to form, I guess, some future vehicle to take this forward. And that's partly, I mean, one could always go back to the EU and say, would you fund another phase three trial? But it may be that then the EU would say, now it's time because it's looking really promising that a market forces would take over. There are two questions about saracatinib, um, the tablet and the drug. Maybe Bernard, you want to answer the um, question from Astrid and from Chris? Yeah, so, so the saracatinib is, is taken orally and it is taken in tablet form, uh, as you said, Chris. Uh, but this tablet can be crushed for patients uh, who have a jaw uh, that is locked up. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no data on people getting an irritated throat after taking it as a, in, in its crushed form. It does not irritate the throat. Um, it, it has been reported that people get a little bit of heartburn, um, but this has, is, is very infrequently and does not lead to an irritated throat as, uh, as far as I'm aware from the data that has been collected on serogatinib so far. Yes, and then from Luciana, um, maybe also for you, uh, every three months visits, um, can it, does it have to be in the three sites or not? Bernard, you can respond on that. Yeah, it, it, for every three month visit, you would have to visit one of the sites um because uh, as i said we do several tests we do a blood draw we do uh, urine collection the blood draw has to be done by somebody who is experienced in fop uh, we want it to be done by the same lab we want some of the tests to be done by the same physician to avoid uh, getting differences between two different physicians who perform a test and, and can get different results from that um, so, so it would have to be uh, a visit to your local uh, to to one of the three sites every three months. Yes. But I think Richard, but, maybe you can give an answer. There's a probably a patient living nearby Manchester. Maybe you have an arrangement. I, I think, don't think. Yeah, I, 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 as I sort of alluded, I think you know, I think we would look at at a case. So I think you know, as you say, there are safety bloods that are needed, um, but you know. I, I think we've we, we've done this with other trials whereby you could use a local lab uh, at a, another site as long as we've validated that. And again, I appreciate you know it might create a bit more administration for the for the lead site in Amsterdam to deal with all that. But I think there are ways that we can get around that. And you know there are again with this technology, there might be ways. You know, if you're doing a cages score, you might be able to do that virtually. So I think we would be looking at. I would be trying to adapt. You know, stick to the protocol from a safety point of view. But again, I think we might look at different ways um, because we do realise that again, for adults with this condition, you know, it, it can become more challenging to visit, um, to travel, and you know, I think I, th I think so. I, I would the question that's answered. I wouldn't put it down as a complete no. I think you'd have to look at it and look at if it was the same lab that they were going to. Urine samples could be done. You could have samples sent through the post questionnaires. And with this virtual technology of looking at people, that also is a really good way of doing things. So I think yeah. I think we, we, we would we would do it as a case by case. Yeah, that, I, I agree. You, you have to look at case by case. But I think the mainstream is that um, it is only a very small study. So you want to treat everyone the same uh, and to have the best data. It would be best to come to the sites at the moment that that would I, be I, our I, advice. I, but I, I think it's the advice I think that we, if your end point is the PET CT, that's the important visit. Yeah. Those, those are the really important visits. The other visits are more of a safety and I, I think we can work out ways to deal with it. But yeah, I agree. But as long as the PET CTs are done at the main sites, that's important. Yeah. And, and it, it, I, I think you're talking about um, facilities in the same country, because if you are talking about another country, it would make it difficult. Yeah, yeah. That, I think that that, that isn't possible. Um, and then I see a question about whether um, this drug could help patients with similar diseases. Uh, at our center, probably also other centers, we see those patients with progressive also heteroplasia and pseudo Um for arm endocrinologists. Um, we don't know. 
we don't know. Um, but we uh, th that will be a next step. Um, we, we are looking at it, but we first have to do this uh, trial. Uh, but whenever you want to have any information about it, you can always send an email to um, to us, to Bernard or to myself or to fpeep, uh, dot Amsterdam. Um So it might be. It's um, a very good question. And then Helen um, has a question. No, not, not a question. It was more in response to Luciana in that there are doctors at the at the hospitals in Manchester, the central hospitals, and I know Richard works with uh, Professor McGall, although I think he may be retired now, um, and then Dr. Skay. So they have knowledge, existing knowledge of um, FOP and, yeah. and <laughs> patients. So if, you know, for the, lo looking into alternative trial sites to do some of the more routine checkups not obviously yeah not it was just that was it i was just saying that we have connections in manchester as well well for to to do a trial uh, and for going on with the medication also for the fda and the uh, ema um you have to show you have all uh, you need to gather all the papers that the lab is um has all the uh, official papers that it is doing it all the uh, yeah. being done in the same uh, way uh, a monitor has to go to the site you ha you have to have a collaboration so I, I do understand it um but in this small trial we we have to see whether it is possible or not that's really what i want to say um well from chris i think uh, the non-classic fop that's that's um well, later on, um, we first have to show whether it has an effect. And I think that Richard, uh, uh, Bernard and Alex agrees. Um, because it is a very small study, you want to do it all um, as, as the, the similar that you can compare as much as possible. But that will be for one of the earlier later questions. Stage. It goes Sorry? back to one of the earlier questions, doesn't it, Marilise? You know, this six yeah. months interim report. You know, in the event that suddenly this drug was the most amazing thing that we'd ever seen, and that six months trial, the statistician would say it's not fair to not treat all patients. So it really just depends on the course of how, um, you know, all the trials are designed to take a small group of people to test it safe and also that it has some hint that it's working. And then as you get more and more confidence, you can build up more and more patients. Yeah. Um, so it just depends on the course of you know how this yeah. is all going. And that's and that's a si similar answer to whether this trial will, from Joseph will ever go to international United States. Because of course, if it is working uh, well, uh, the next steps, to phase three, uh, more money, uh, it will all be the future, of course. Yeah. So we've got some other experts on the call as well. We've got two Andrews. Um, I don't know if if anybody else has some sort of further comments. It seems we are. Re oh, oh, we've got another one. Is it possible to have a copy of the recording? Um, yes, I think so. But um, I'm recording it, and I'll have to check. It's all working properly and how it looks, but it should be should be possible. And we'll we'll work with um, maybe with the foundations in Germany, Holland, UK, etc., Sweden, etc. Maybe how we can do that. Yeah, uh, and probably we can put it on the uh, website of the Stop Fop Bernard. I think you can put it on your website, isn't it? On the general Stop Fop website. It, it should be possible uh, if everybody agrees on that. Yes. Okay. Oh, Massimo, so good to hear from him. And of course, this is not the final opportunity to ask questions. So, um, in the presentation, you were talking about surgery. Uh, have you no. have an idea? Well, um, uh, Asad asked us as soon as medication works, we will go to the next step. Yeah. 
So, so we have first to show that the medication is working properly. Proper yeah. Yeah, we still have to go back to the ethics boards and get approval to do it. Yeah. Okay. Probably lunchtime for everyone, or maybe people yeah. eating during this. I don't know if you want to close or Helen or Chris or. Something. Yeah. Um, yeah, just want to echo what uh, the Gray family said earlier and just say thank you to all the um, people who we've got a real widespread of countries who've joined us today, which is really exciting and just goes to show just how connected the FOP community is and how we do all stand together and how much better we are for, for doing that. And just a huge, we cannot extend enough gratitude to the doctors, the researchers, the technicians, everybody who's worked on this stop pop thing. I know there's a lot of mums in this group who've got young children and I know that our children can't take part in the trial, but to sit here and just listen to it gives us so much hope that, you know, that we are really getting closer. Um, and I do hope that, you know, you get the results that you're looking for. So thank you very much to everyone for giving up their time on Saturday um, and have a good day. Thanks, Helen. Very kind of you. Thanks, everybody, thank you. for joining. Stay safe. Stay well. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Nice to see you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers.